Hey everyone, it's Bookless Pete. I'm back and I really am bookless today because I want to talk about magazines. Um, I don't even know if people really know these days, even people who read a lot of SF or a lot of mysteries, know that there are actual magazines that publish brand new stories every month or every other month. I want to talk about four in particular that are um, all published by the same publisher called Penny Publications. If you live in the United States and you ever walk into a Barnes & Noble or a big drugstore and you look down at the very bottom rack, like way in the back, behind all the word search magazines and all the crossword puzzle magazines and all the Sudoku magazines, you might find four magazines called Asimov's Science Fiction, Analog Science Fiction, Alfred Hitchcock's Mystery Magazine, and Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. I've read these for a long time. I've read some of them since I, were a kid. I was a kid. Um, they're cool. I find a lot of new writers in them. Um, I read, read them off and on. I have subscriptions to all four of them now. I have e-subscriptions to all four of them. I've sent my stories to all four of them. Um, I had a story in one of them once, in Alfred Hitchcock's once, so I should say that as a disclosure, I guess. I'm promoting them because they do provide a, an outlet for a lot of writers. Um, and they have great stories. I've found, like I said, I've found many, many of my favorite writers in them over the years. Uh, if you don't like short stories, you don't like short stories, But which is a curious thing. I don't know why... Well, I have a theory of why people don't like them um, as much as novels. Because every time you start a new uh, new novel or a new piece of fiction, you really have to, it takes a bit to get into the mindset of the story. It's not like reading an article where you can skim it, like some art, magazine article in whatever magazine, if, if they still exist, you know, The New Yorker or something I always found. Because I used to read The New Yorker as well. I always found the articles were easy to dive right into. Because if you get bored in the middle of an article, you could just skip to the end and see what the author's conclusion is. You know, that's not going to work with a short story. So I think short stories require a little extra effort, concentration to get into. And the best short stories can be as satisfying as novels, I believe. Of course, and if, of course, with people you know, do get into the world of a, of a, a fictive world of, of some creator. You know, they tend to want to stay with those characters. So I can understand why people, short stories aren't as popular. Seems counterintuitive, though, where you think, like, shorter is... Shorter is... Well, I guess I'm contradicting myself, because... On the face of it, shorter... We have shorter attention spans these days. Uh, but like I was saying, it is different, diff more difficult to get into a short story. Uh, a, an excellent writer has to do a lot of things very quickly in a short story. But for those people who are interested in short stories or just looking for a way to see what's going on in the different, in, especially in the genres of science fiction and fantasy or of mystery, I think the magazines are a good way to do it. These, the ebook the electronic subscriptions of these magazines are very inexpensive the, each one of the four that I've mentioned and I'll put links to their the sites where you can order them if you want to those aren't these are not affiliate links or anything they just uh, I just want to promote them uh, for a reason I'll go into in a minute why I think it's especially important to promote them now but each one of them like I said there's four different ones each one of them is just six dollars every other month you get billed for each magazine each magazine has comes out every other month they have about a, a full uh, paperbacks worth of fiction about 90,000 words of fiction in each one of them I think and they have a few little departments they're all, all little separate personality so six dollars every two months you get, you get one of them they, they send you an email where you can download a PDF or an EPUB version of them they, they, the, the magazines are slightly different. Each time Analog is, you know, originally started as Astounding Magazine back in the 30s, I guess. 
That's the famous science fiction magazine, the famous science fiction magazine that survived all these years, originally called Astounding. Uh, made famous by John W. Campbell, who was probably the major uh, editor for decades, who has a very... <laughs> <laughs> has a very colorful reputation now. He he is famous for developing a Isaac Asimov and the Foundation uh, stories, the robot stories, and he had certainly had his pre prejudices and his fixed ideas. He also was a big promoter of L. Ron Hubbard and Scientology. Uh, the f the Scientology book uh, Dianetics was originally serialized in analog um, so you know he's and he uh, John W. Campbell is probably most famous as a writer for writing Who Goes There which was adapted twice in two or I guess even more than twice as the movie The Thing The Thing from Another World and then The Thing the Kurt Russell movie and, and earlier than that the uh, uh, the movie produced by in the 50s, produced by Howard Hawks, and some people think consider it a Howard Hawks movie. Uh, he had certain prejudices that that, or biases, I guess, maybe better word to say it. I mean, I'm not an expert on his career, but it always struck me that uh, as since. John W. Campbell's uh, um, influence, power over the field was so strong because Astounding was the major magazine for many years and paid the best rates. And Asimov and Campbell himself did not believe. He believed that human beings were the pinnacle of evolution. He did not believe, he would not publish stories that showed aliens superior to humans. This is according to Asimov's biography or an article I read by Asimov once. And therefore, Asimov, who did not share that belief, put no aliens into his robot stories or into his Foundation series because he thought it was ridiculous to think that one species could be superior to every other. So his way around it, and to, and to still be able to publish in the industry and to be published in the, in the main magazine of the industry was to simply create a, a universe of future history where there was only human beings in it so he didn't have to deal with the issue of other aliens. So this is becoming a history of the analog which is and there's been many editors since then of course he's one of the most uh, influential people who of the field, and people have a lot of issues with him now. Oh, thanks, Horn. Um, when I started reading Analog in junior high school, high school, there was the editor was Ben Bova, who was much more of a humanist. Um, he was an excellent editor, a uh, good writer. I think he only passed away a few years ago, and he kind of widened the magazine a bit. I enjoyed reading it during those eras. I really had not read it much since then. Uh, Stanley Schmidt was the editor for a very long time. There's a new editor now. I've only read the last couple uh, issues. Um, this current issue has a story by David Gerald in it, which I haven't read yet. It's a novella, and I'm looking forward to that. David Gerald is one of my favorite SF writers which I don't know if he's really writing novels anymore. Which, uh, another great thing about these, uh, these, especially the two science fiction ones, is there's a lot of people who maintain their writing careers even after their novels have gone out of favor or if they've just gotten older and they like to keep their hang, hand in. Last issue, there was a story, an analog, co-written by Barry Malzberg, who must be in his 80s, must be nearly 90. He hasn't written many novels in many, many years one of my favorite writers of the 60s. Um, 
So it's nice to see that. I'm looking forward to this David Gerald novel. Asimov's magazine uh, started in, a, I believe, 77. It's the newest of the three. I know that's not very new. I remember even buying the first issue in high school. Kind of replaced in the zeitgeist of, mag of science fiction magazines. It kind of replaced Galaxy magazine. Not directly, but... Um, it's quote-unquote softer science fiction, meaning it's a broader uh, array of science fiction than is Asimov, I mean, than is analog. It's not really true, though. I mean, you could see hard SF stories in either one. Uh, analog also has a couple of fact articles, a couple of speculative fact articles every issue, often written by science fiction writers. Asimov, they both have... Uh, book review sections. Does Analog have a book review section? I'm not sure. I can't remember. Asimov does one that is alternating between a couple different uh, reviewers, including Norman Spinrad, who's always it's always fun to read what Norman Spinrad has to say about fiction. He's usually angry about something. Usually angry for the right reasons. He's usually angry on on behalf of a writer who he thinks should be. Uh, um, Speaking of Spinrad as a book reviewer here, he's usually angry on behalf of some writer that he thinks should be getting better recognition. Uh, Asimov, you see a lot of the big uh, writers in there. There's a writer I've followed in Asimov for many years called Greg Egan, which is uh, one of my, I believe he's Australian. Uh, one of my favorite hard SF writers wrote a lot about virtual reality and things like that in the time. He, he wrote some novels, didn't quite, novels didn't quite have the impact I think that he would have hoped, but he's still writing uh, novellas and uh, novelettes, maybe novels too. Uh, Jeffrey Ford, who's a great literary science fiction fantasy and science fiction writer, had a story in the last issue. Uh, Asimov's And analog together give you a really kind of overview about what's going on at SF and what kind of thing SF is is uh, is concerned with today. So if you don't get a chance to read every single book that comes out in science fiction, like I don't, um, it's a great way to keep up with the field. Then the other two are mystery magazines. Ellery Queen, named after the writer, the writing pair Ellery Queen, who also wrote novels about the character Ellery Queen. And they were, at least one of them, Danny, Danny, I don't, never had, knew how to say it, was the, the first editor of Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. And Alfred Hiscock's magazine, Mystery Magazine, came in about the same time. They both came in, I don't know, the 50s. You know, Alfred Hiscock's Ma uh, Mystery Magazine came in around the time his television show started. And you used to be able to find everywhere, and I know people still read these. I still read them when I can find them, these little paperbacks of Alfred Hitchcock Presents, stories not for the nervous stories. I uh, used to have a title like that. Um, and so this, a lot of them were, uh, a lot of those magazines, I mean, a lot of those paperbacks were full, filled with stories reprinted from these, these little digests. And uh, between those two, there's a slight difference there, too, in the two magazines. They both have a wide variety of crime stories, mystery stories. Once in a while, you'll see something in Hitchcock's is a little bit more, leans a little bit more towards uh, paranormal ghost stories, that kind of thing, implication of ghost stories. Uh, Ellery Queen has a lot more l l different departments. Uh, they have... Uh, they own the rights to Black Mass Magazine, which was the greatest pulp magazine ever created, which started the careers of Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler, and... Um, Earl Stanley Gardner and many others. Uh, they they so they incorporate kind of as a, a little feature in there. They have one called a, 
uh, one story they sing off is a black mass selection, which is a more um, uh, noir-ish story that appears in Ellery Queen each each issue. Um, I wish to God someday I'm just praying that they're going to bring black bring back Black Mass the Mask as its own magazine. Uh, it probably never happened. Anyway, it's nice that they kind of keep the tradition of of noir along by calling one of their departments a Black Mass Selection. They also have a uh, international passport to crime, I think they call it, in Ellery Queen, which is a translation of a story. I guess it isn't... Yeah, it's usually a translation, but it's from some other... It's definitely a, a story from some other country, a, a Japanese detective or... Uh, German writer or something so it's a great way to learn about other writers all over the world that don't get as much uh, notice in English because unfortunately the, the 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 state of translation in publishing is just so one-sided these days where where so many books get translated in English all over the world but we don't really get enough of what's out there in the rest of the world as as I would like and as we should they also have a department of first stories where every issue there's a couple of stories by someone who's never had a crime story printed before. So they have all the, those departments. They have a very good book reviewer there at Ellery Queen, who I wish I knew the name of, but it's called The Jury Box, his, his column is, I think. And I've discovered a lot of great writers. That's how I discovered Anthony Horowitz, was from a, v, a review in Ellery Queen. Uh, they publish uh, a lot of work by a writer named David Dean. I think he's an excellent short story writer. I believe he's self-published um, some of his collections and, sorry, indie published some of his collections and some other books. But you know, he's in there a f few times a year and always a great story, a lot of historical mysteries. Another thing they try to do in Ellery Queen a lot is... Uh, and this comes from something I read by the editor on her blog, on the magazine's blog. Each of these magazines, each of the mystery magazines have a blog. They try and publish uh, all the, su all the subgenres, whether they're in, in fashion or not. So in, in Ellery Queen, you'll always get a couple private eye stories. You'll always get a couple from the point of view of cop stories. You always get something that could uh, that could appear in any sort of mass market literary magazine or something like that. It's just a, a, a character story that that involves crime, uh, historical mysteries. Both Hitchcock and Queen uh, always have a couple of historical mysteries in there, which is. I'm always looking for a good historical mystery series. I haven't really found one that, that I like as much as I want to like it. There's a couple of, of set in ancient Rome. There's a couple, of, you know, there's Brother Cadfile, I guess, which is kind of like, what if Name of the Rose was a series um, of books, but I, I can't get into any of those series very much, so... I guess I like the idea of historical mysteries more than I actually like reading long historical mysteries. Uh, Ellery Queen also has a lot of Holmes stuff. Uh, occasionally they'll have a writer who's writing new Ellery Queen stories too, uh, with permission, I assume. Like, like, and um, actually Hitchcock is publishing Holmes stuff now too. I guess because of the rights are more open now, like in Alfred Hitchcock's, I'll move on to that one, that's the last one I want to talk about, is, uh, has less departments than, than Ellery Queen, it's just like straight up fiction, it has also a little book review section, but it's mainly just story after story after story, uh, this one, this one I haven't read yet, is coming, this is the issue I have on my thing right here. see this is a Dr. Watson story by James Tipton, this that writer had done one before of a, of a solo story of Dr. Watson and I enjoyed that previous one so I'm looking forward to that and then um, I'm just going to go back and look at some of the covers here's Ellery Queen's current issue there oh see how it has incorporates Black Mask up there in the corner um 
So this is what the PDF would look like if you're getting the PDFs of all these, which looks exactly like a print copy, right? And then if you're if you get the EPUB version and you get and if with a subscription you get both versions, it looks sort of like this. It's more like you know it's got all these hot these links and stuff, so you can you can skip around in the in the copy more on your e-reader and. Um, I find it easier to read because the PDF, I mean, look at the PDF on my phone. I can't read, I can't read that. I'm not going to be able to read that. Of course, you can make it big and stuff, but then that's going to, it's a PDF. It's going to slide all over the place. So the reason I decided to do a video about these, if anyone's still listening, um, is a situation that happened this, this last January with, with Amazon. These magazines have been around forever in print editions. When the Kindles started coming out, Amazon created a program on their website where they would sell magazines uh, by subscription. And uh, it's very popular. These magazines all went up, way up in circulation because of that, that new market that opened up. And they were able to raise their pay rates in many cases. <coughs> Uh, that went on for, I don't know, 10 years or something, and this last year, Amazon told all the publishers of all these magazines they weren't going to do that anymore, that they're sh shuttering that, that program and forcing all, their, all the magazines who chose to remain on Amazon to become part of the Kindle Unlimited program, which means if you join Kindle Unlimited, which is, I think, about $12, $13 a month now. You can subscribe to as many, ma you can read as many magazines as you want. Any of these four magazines, uh, any of the other science fiction magazines, such as Clark's World. Uh, Neil Clark is uh, pretty prominent in the science fiction community, and he did a lot of writing on this issue. Uh, Uncanny, uh, there's, a, you know, and there's other literary magazines and there's just other regular magazines the new yorker many many magazines now now that's another little extra bonus you get for your for your kindle unlimited subscription which is fine and it's a good deal frankly if you're i i order all four of these magazines which is 24 dollars every two months so it works out to about 12 dollars a month for four magazines Which basically is almost as what I would be paying for a, a Kindle Unlimited subscription, and I could just read them all as part of that subscription. But I decided not to do that because I know, as a former um, self-published writer, uh, and from from here, what other people do. You know, you get so little money when your work is read in that Kindle Unlimited program, and it's voluntary for for authors kind of voluntary because if you don't if you don't put your indie book in that un unlimited program you're not going to get any views because Amazon really fo uh, focuses on, on, the, on the things that are exclusive with them and so these magazines then either lost a lot of money that they're making on Amazon or they or they have the potential of losing a lot of money because if if you do read if you do pick up the magazine and you skip through you get like a, a fractions of a penny per page read and if they and they they make much less money than they would if they were each getting their own subscriptions so they set up their own subscription sites these magazines and a lot of other magazines like Clark's World which is run by Neil Clark which is another excellent science fiction magazine that I I subscribe to and then and uncanny which is a popular one that i joined the patreon of i guess clark's world i joined the patreon too and there's another site where you can subscribe to fan the magazine of fantasy and science fiction which i which i might do later and there's another good magazine called the dark uh, which is a horror magazine that i might subscribe to i gotta see i gotta make sure i'm gonna read all these four first 
that has there's kind of a, a big website where you can subscribe to a lot of different magazines I'll put the name of it in there but these penny uh, publications which is the ones I've been talking about mostly which is Hitchcock's Asimov's Analog Ellery Queen have their own home in-house subscription uh, platforms you have to go to two separate ones there's one for Asimov's and Analog and there's one for the two mystery magazines and I decided to to order directly through the 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 in-house option because I really love these magazines they've been around a long time I hate to see them disappear forever as most magazines have you know and sometimes these magazines disappear for a while and come back in different forms like Weird Tales is always around in one form or another but not the original form but these have been like continuously published uh, for all this time and I really think they are a part of history and if you care about these genres like I do uh, I think it's a, a great way to do you could another advantage of subscribing this way as opposed to like the magazine subscription site or anything like that is you can cancel at any time so you don't have to buy like a $36 a year subscription for the for the ebooks you can you can order a subscription pay six bucks cancel it the next month and that's all you have to pay so you could try one out if you do uh, try one out let me know in the comments I think if anyone's listening now still I just want to say thank you like and subscribe to my channel like and subscribe to any of these magazines and let me know what you think thank you